I mentioned before, my name is Brian Roberts. I'm the Associate Director of Science at LumpCon. My email address is here. You can see that several times throughout today's presentation. Um, my co-leads are Justin in the audience um, and Jimmy Nelson, who is at the University of Louisiana Bob Jack, um, who is on the audience today. So I start with this image for an important reason. Is the, the Chapalaya Basin is right here in the middle of our image. And it's often thought to be very remote. Okay, but if you look within that basin, I mean, you can see we're sitting here today in, in Morgan City. Uh, we go up to, to Iberia, uh, where we're going to be on Thursday night. So anybody that you know has learned about this and want to learn more, we're going to have another one of these town halls on Thursday. So please promote it to your friends and have them go check us out there. Um, I should mention also that on the website, these presentations are also there on the on the Elthenier, uh, website hosted by Sea Grant, so you can always find out more information about that. But if you move higher up in the in the basin, you see we're bordered by the cities of Lafayette and Baton Rouge. And if you look at what is the population of people within a 100 mile radius of this basin? It's about 3.3 million, which is on par with about with the population within a 100 mile radius of one of the near, the closest near to our east, Grand Bay in Mississippi, is about 3.3 million as well. You go to the nearest one to our west, in uh, Aransas in Texas, um, that's actually about four times smaller of a population within a 100 mile radius. If you go and try to think about how easy is it for people to go there on a field trip, for a school trip, for example? You might think about maybe 75 miles is the way for most of us drive around here. That's probably an hour. You know, that's what the speed limit says, but you know, um, that's about 2.2 .2 million. So there's a lot of people within there. And within that 75 mile radius, there are 860 schools, which is over 456,000 students. Also, when you talk about access, well, you know, we're in a remote place. You know, how do people get access to get on the river or get in these environments? There are about 150 boat launches that are found throughout this space. There's a lot of points of access. I think that's important to keep in mind. Okay, so one of the things I want to do is it's not just Justin, Jimmy, and I putting together this proposal and, and thinking about, you know, what would make a great near site and, and why it should be in a Chapalaya Basin. And we were trying to put together what our team was. We wanted to try to get people that had different backgrounds and perspectives and how, and how um, this might be an important uh, location to have in here and its contribution to the national system. So we have people from um, Nature Conservancy, from a variety of universities, Louisiana Lafayette, Lumpcon, LSU, Nichols State University. We have people that work in education and outreach, in communication coordination, working with youth wetland and outreach programs. We have Audubon, uh, Louisiana, actually now Audubon Delta, I'll update that. The US Geologic Survey, uh, Restore the Mississippi River Coalition, and Restore Retreat. We have a diverse group of people that are trying to contribute on an everyday basis. But we're here to have these meetings to start welcoming more of your feedback, getting more of the public input in terms of what it is we should be doing in, the, in our selection process. So, both Kristen and Robert gave you an overview of some of that national policy and the approach to what the is about. And I want to highlight just one of those criteria that's at a national level for the system. The site's contribution to the biogeographical and typological balance of the National Estuary Research Preserve System. Okay. Get this down to you know, words that we all understand. You're trying to find something that's a unique contribution that contributes to the overall system, not just being something that's a copy of what we have at different places throughout the country. What is it unique that this system, a new near site, can add to that national network? So no will give priority consideration of proposals to establish reserves in biogeographic regions or sub-regions or incorporating types that are not represented in the system. So what is it unique about Louisiana that we can offer? And if you actually go to Governor Edwards' letter to NOAA requesting that we be considered um, to have a site in the network. Louisiana would be like to nominate a site in the Delta biogeographic region for inclusion in the years. 
We're defined in life to many people around the world by our river delta and how that influences the way we live our lives, right? So how do we best design a delta near some? So what, what are the components of a near, like of a delta for a near? So a delta near, really deep this far. <laughs> Okay, so you have the river and it's alluvial flood plain. So you have all the water that goes over and carries over to the wetlands around. You have the river delta itself and you have the estuarine ecosystem down at the bottom. Right? So we can conceptualize that and think about it from the perspective of the basin. Whole. Okay, and so I have this map here. Um, for, for two reasons. One is talking about some of the major watersheds that exist throughout Louisiana and highlighting the Atchafalaya Vermilion over on the left. So the white line is where land was in the 1930s. The green line is the area where we have land in 2010. So while we do have areas in the Atchafalaya Basin where we have loss, we're losing land in here like we are in lots of other areas of the state. We also have areas that have immense growth because we have a prorating delta. We have active land building taking place in here. Which thinking about it from a perspective of being able to look at things in the long term, that climatic changes over time, it makes the Chafalaya Basin an ideal place to look um, for a near sun. Put this back down at the bottom. All right. So when we were trying to start thinking about how to conceptualize what a, a near site would be for the Chafalaya Basin, our overall vision for an approach to development of the, of the Chafalaya near is to include all the key habitats or ecosystems looked at in the near selection process with the idea being the Chafalaya Basin provides a unique river delta that encompasses all the key relevant habitats found in the Basin. Essentially, the basin is a mini Louisiana. Okay, it's essentially a small scale version of Louisiana representing all the habits, habitats found in the state and is a model for how the state and other delicaic systems form. And if you break up the, the basin, you can think about it up here in blue at the top. That's where we have our alluvial floodplains are. As you move down, here where we are and down below, you're moving into the river delta and the fresh marsh. So, and as you move away from the rivers, the river delta, as you're moving into brackish and salt marshes. So what do each of these look like? Okay, so if you go in the, the alluvial floodplain, the upper part of the basin is bottom one part of the forest. The high sites, the higher elevation areas that have low flooding are dominated by American sweet gum, water oak, sugar berry, the low line of sites with high flooding, overcup of oak, water hickory, green ash. As you move down the system further, you move into the cypress tupelo swamp, which many people think about for Louisiana, right? Um, and then, move this yet again. Um, we also have shrub shrub communities in some areas. We have water elm, swamp privet, button, bush, scattered cypress uh, present in there. As we move further downstream and we move into the river delta and the fresh marsh, you go to the, the delta islands, right? You go to the upstream tips of those islands. You have black willow with understory of elephant ear, rice cut grass, climbing hemp weed. As the elevation decreases and you move closer to the sea, you have tidal fresh marsh vegetation dominating as you're seeing in some of these lower pictures. And then that zone also contains extensive submerged aquatic vegetation, low intertidal and subtidal areas. And then you move into the brackish and salt marsh zones. As you move away from those river delts, I've depicted it largely over to our west, but also as you move into Four Lee Bay and that area over to the east, um, the estuaries are fringed with brackish and salt marshes, and to a lesser extent, we have black mango. So it's not just the vegetation and the habitats, right? It's the animals that are present in here. In this 
these include critical habitats for Louisiana black bear, neotropical migratory birds, American alligators, fish, and a lot of invertebrates. Many of which we like to eat. The Audubon has declared it critical bird habitat for many species. We also have more than a dozen threatened or endangered species, including Titan clover and other birds of concern, West Indian manatee, Palo sturgeon, and at least five species of sea turtles that are found within our basin. Well, this is an incredibly rich and diverse habitat within the basin for both the vegetation as well as the fauna that are present. I think one of the important things here is that any proposed Atchafalaya near site would only require state lands. So with this map is depicting everything in green are state-owned lands. Everything that's in yellow are federally owned lands. And then we highlight one because it's one of our partners over here to the west. Uh, the Paul Rainey uh, Wildlife Sanctuary is owned by Audubon. But there's a lot of lands owned by PNC and a lot of other organizations. That's the Nature Conservancy. Sorry, in that academic acronym uh, language. Uh, but you, one thing that's really interesting about this is that we have extensive state lands within each of the regions I've just discussed. So we have extensive state lands within the alluvial floodplain, both the northern part where you have those bottomland forests, and the southern part where you move into the Cypress Tupelo uh, swamps. In the River Delta, we have one of the most extensive areas of River Delta that's actually owned by the state. And then in the upper Appalachian salt marshes, we have very extensive state lands. And then we have all of those connecting state-owned water lines. And that's what I said here. It's amazing how sometimes the slides have like, got a step ahead of me and I don't remember that I have that there. Um, in, in total, we have about 65% of the basin is actually owned by the state. So you don't have to go and try to find new lands to come up with a, a near site or in the Chapalaya Basin. The other thing is, is that, you know, it's not like all of these state lands are going to be part of the basin. As Kristen pointed out at the beginning, it's like, yeah, there's $30 million roughly over 30 reserves. It's really hard to manage and, and sample and document um, what's going on if you had all the state lands included. But if you have the ability, these are all potential sites. And that's part of where your contribution to this conversation are. Trying to figure out where are the most strategic places for us to try to focus on in developing what a near site might be. That would have the most benefits to the most people and be able to still be able to characterize what it means to be part of the Louisiana Delta system. And of course the long-term goal, and Dr. Twilley alluded to this too, is that where the site starts is not necessarily where it ends. Many of the near sites have grown in size over time. They change some of, of where their priorities and foci are in terms of what it is that their, their, uh, their near site is trying to accomplish because of changes that happen within in, in those respective basins. So our long-term goal is to work with our federal. So there's a lot of federal lands that are here and other organizations, things like Nature Conservancy and Audubon and private landowners to expand them here um, into the future. But this is all part of that process after the site is selected. Right now, we're basically trying to propose what a potential site is and highlight where the strengths are. So, I mean, I mentioned this point already. I'm using how my slides actually give me my points and I just follow those as opposed to talking as I go. Um, of the 1.6 million acres designated to be part of the Atchafalaya Estuarine Zone, there are about 750,000 acres of state-owned lands and about 300,000 acres of state-owned water bodies that accounts for more than 65% of the total area. And there are greater than 10 state or federally designated wildlife areas within this basin. Okay, so this was touched on in the previous two presentations, but I want to kind of talk about it just a little bit here. I want to sort of reserve most of the time to hear feedback and have discussions with those of you in attendance here in Morgan City and those of you online. So, Dr. Twilley alluded to this in terms of some of the key components of what a reserve is about. So they're established for long-term stewardship, research, education, and training. Okay, in terms of stewardship, Provence and Chapalaya Reserve would use current monitoring efforts and restoration activities to increase physical and biological monitoring in the fresh, floating, brackish, and salt marshes as you move down through the basin. In terms of research, 
the proposed Chaplau Reserve would provide vital research opportunities and access. It would be the only active delta in the estuary system in the NER network, adding value to the significance of the research conducted at the site. In the education, the Chaplau Basin is perfectly situated off a variety of opportunities for learning. It's centrally located along the coast, right, talking about how many people are within school-aged children are within um, a reasonable trip of the basin, uh, provides relatively short travel distances from major coastal cities and universities. <coughs> and in terms of training, this region is an ideal place to discuss the interconnectedness of engineering, ecology, and its impacts on communities. So part of what we're doing is to try to establish partners in terms of what might be an effective near site. And so what we've been doing to this point is we've actually built a growing number of partnerships as we're trying to develop what this near site is. So Justin is from the Chappalaya National <coughs> Heritage Area. Um, we've given presentations to and had discussions with the Chappalaya River Basin Conservation <coughs> Enhancement Task Force. Louisiana Sea Grants, obviously very much involved. Uh, the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Most of the state lands that are mentioned within any of these three basins are actually operated by LDWF, so they're going to obviously be a <coughs> partner. And then with, on our team, we have a variety of these different groups that are uh, present. And then we have St. Mary of Cell, who's well represented here today, and many of you know, um, have been very helpful in this process of moving forward. So really the question is, how can you help to contribute to the LA Near selection process? Because all the things I want you to see are at the bottom, I'm going to move this back up to the top. Okay, so you can reach out to our team. You know, Justin, you can reach out to him. I'm trying to put my email out here as many times as I can, so you can read, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can also find us through the overall LA Near website at Secret. And so on your two page handouts, they have contact information for the NEAR. Uh, the one that's about the NEAR process has all of these things on it. Actually, this is copied and pasted right here in the phone. Um, so, you know, the, the website's on here, finding on Facebook, Twitter, uh, there's a list here. And of course, you can send emails directly to Delta NEAR at LSU. Okay, there's also a uh, frequently asked questions. And I know Dr. Truly went through a few of them, but I just, there's really, you can't go through some of these enough to just sort of make sure that you understand what it is we're talking about here. Anytime you get the federal government coming in with something, you know, there's concerns about what is that going to mean and how I use these different locations. Okay? So, Kristen talked a lot about this. Uh, in her part, and so did Dr. Quilly, you know, what programs and benefits do research reserves offer? They apply science and education to improve management of estuaries. Each of the reserves is somewhat unique. It brings together local stakeholders, scientists, land management professionals, educators to understand coastal management issues and generate local integrated solutions. <clears throat> Will the state have to purchase land for the Louisiana Reserve? No. We're only considering existing publicly owned lands and adjacent public trust waters. Will a new reserve involve NOAA taking land from the state? NOAA does not own or manage land in the reserve, nor does the designation of reserve add new state or federal regulations. All of this is, as Dr. Twilley and Kristen both uh, described, this is a, the NOAA and the federal government are providing an infrastructure for how this, all these near sites uh, can run. But in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, it's all done by the state. And again, I'm no questions. Will the federal government run the research? The Louisiana near will be a partnership between NOAA and the state of Louisiana. The state is responsible for day-to-day -day management. So, and state is responsible for 30 percent of the funding for reserve operations. And the most important one to most people is that does the designation of reserve bring more rules and regulations? No, it does not add any new regulations to state-owned lands. 
recreational hunting and fishing, which is obviously very important near and dear to most of us that live in, in this area, um, as well as commercial and fishing allowed near sites. The designation of the reserve does not preclude existing uses, it does not result in the total preservation of the area. And a lot of these things are going to be through conversations with all of you as we're developing the management plan for once a site is selected. Okay, so there are more frequently asked questions and responses can be found on the website um, in this document, which you should also have a handout of uh, as well. And so really trying to get through this as quickly as possible, giving you a quick overview of sort of how we're viewing this and what we think the Escapolite Basin has to offer. And really the rest of this time, we really want to develop, uh, devote to seeing what questions you have. 